Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jamar. Today's episode 155 and we're going to be interviewing Amy D. Good morning, Amy. How are you? Good morning, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's afternoon for me, but it's morning for you. You, I know you're on the West Coast. Where are you? I'm actually in Nevada. I'm in Las Vegas. Oh, okay. Las Vegas. Nice. Nice. It must be. Is it hot there? Uh, it's getting cooler with this year, the in the summer, which is the highest is usually in July. So uh, <clears throat> it was about hundred. 1314 but that was like a couple of days um it's usually a little bit lower than that now it's in the 90s and okay yeah all right it's been like jersey lately but here let's uh let's get started i want to hear about your childhood tell us about you know growing up and stuff well um i grew up as the youngest of a large family And most of my siblings are at least five to seven years older than me. And they didn't want to play with me. They pretty much, you know, wanted to do their own thing. It's not like I blame them or anything. But um, I started um, overeating at a very young age, uh, about eight years old. Um, that me and, too. We were talking about before I have issues as well. That um, mine started with my mom leaving at eight. And cookies uh, made me feel better. Oh, and if one I, cookie made me feel better, how about two? And then how about three? And then how about four? Because now I'm not feeling so good. I should have some more. Well, I find that once you start then you try to recapture that initial, you know, ah, it's like mm-hmm. feeling. Just like any other drug. <clears throat> Just like any other drug. It's my unfortunate, well, I not that any drug is good, but food is definitely my drug of choice. Yeah. And I became an emotional leader, whether I was lonely, bored, um, angry, frustrated, depressed, anxious, uh, big procrastination tool. Um, and as I got older, being that the emotional overeating was never addressed, it developed into compulsive overeating, binging, um, the whole nine yards with the shame, the guilt, the self-hatred because you can't believe that you're doing this to yourself yet you can't stop especially once you start uh the what's the uh quote uh, uh one bite is too many and a thousand aren't enough yeah exactly because i know oa takes a lot of what they have from Alcoholics Anonymous, and you just changed the name or the words alcoholic to overeater, right? Right. Uh, yeah. I, well, <clears throat> AA is like the parent program. Yeah. All of the others stemmed off from that. So thankfully, uh, uh, Overeaters Anonymous was developed because it's helped so many thousands of people. And I think it's pretty old because I I wrote a book and in my book, I mentioned OA and I think they started in 1963. Very possible. Yeah, they started a while ago. Like they're not any type of new organization. Like they're well established. And the OA book, I know, like I said, I have, I haven't read through it yet, but I know it's just stories. Um. You know, Overeaters Anonymous, I don't think, believe it or not, I've read. I've read, of course, the 12 and 12, 12 12 steps, 12 12 traditions traditions of Overeaters Anonymous. Um, There is also a free PDF that exists that gives an OA version of the big book. Oh, really? Yep. 
And your 12 Steps and 12 Traditions is a separate book, or are they taking it from Bill's? No, the book is 12 Steps and 12 Traditions of Overeaters Anonymous. Okay, so everything's different. I'm sure it's, <clears throat> I don't know how much different it is. You probably um, borrowed some stuff, but not everything. Um, I mean, the reason I wanted to stay, I didn't really read the AA Big Book because there, even though there are similarities, obviously, between AA and OA, but there are differences too. Oh, so, big time. yeah. So I didn't when when I did, um, like if I went to a meeting that went into the into the AA Big Book, um, I wasn't always relating because it's not exactly the same thing. No, so, I suggest you read it because I guess it depends what part they're talking about. Because there are parts where you you are going to go, oh yeah, I've done that. <laughs> like okay, I, I get where that's coming because that saved me at first when I first saw um, AA in rehab. My first words were, "Here's the God shit," and then thank God I found out about those words God as we understood it. So I could have been it was my thing. It wasn't, I, I didn't have to go back to being a Christian from the when I was a child. So that was the big thing that saved me. But reading through it, being an overeater, I, I see a lot of the same patterns. Because addiction is addiction. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, but like <clears throat> in the in the stories that you read in the AA Big Book, it's like, you know, I'm not going to go to jail for overeating. Exactly. Um, so there are differences when it comes to relating. Obviously, the addiction part is practically the same, but the ramifications and how quickly they set in is much different. It may take, well, it depends on how frequently somebody is binging, but you you know it, it could happen i would think much more quickly the ramifications escalating with alcohol rather than overeating overeating is you're damaging yourself but i think it's over a longer period of time yeah and the one thing um that i was talking about i forget with who the thing about overeating is you have to eat. You don't have to overeat, but you need to literally eat to live. But I don't need to have alcohol to live. My body, that's not a requirement of life. Food is a requirement of life. And to me, that's what made it. It's make, it still does to this day. It makes it so hard to control. Well, and sugar is more addictive than cocaine, morphine. So, I mean, that's been published. So, and honestly, there's sugar in everything and hidden sugars. And people may not realize, well, there's, I mean, sugar is carbs and there's carbs in like everything. Mm -hmm. And if you eat too many carbs, that's when you're going to gain weight even more than the fatty. Well, the thing is, fatty foods also have carbs in them usually, like junk food. If you, if you if it's potato chips, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention food, but um, even though that's fat, it's also carbs because it's carb based but um carbs are in everything the key to not only getting rid of the addiction but the key to losing weight and losing fat is to lower your carbs because your body has to metabolize all of the carbs first before it will metabolize fat. 
So for you to be able to lose fat, you need to eating low carb. Yeah, I, I'm, I was thinking about starting that keto diet where I eat mostly meat and stuff. Yeah, but I wouldn't go no carb. No? No. What I would do is I... I have uh, what I do and what I have my clients do is focus on protein. Like you said, doesn't matter whether it's vegan protein or, you know, uh, fish, meat, whatever. And then, you know, start with protein. When you're filling your plate, start with protein. Then add green leafy vegetables. And then... If you, for for those of us that are not food addicted that are watching, um, if they want to have a starch, make that like the smallest thing on the plate and eat it last so that you're already full or getting full from the, from the protein and vegetables. But okay. vegetables are fine. You need some carbs, but most people eat a lot more carbs than they should. Gotcha. So what was school like growing up? Did you um did you have any like how did the issues with overeating affect you? I guess you could say. Did it did it spill over to school? Did you know because for me, I guess a, an example would be was I was made fun of for being heavy. Oh yeah. I'll never forget, and it brought me to tears. Um, I went to sleepaway camp, and I'm sorry to say this, but girls uh, between, you know, teenagers or even younger can be um, very insensitive. Oh, they could be downright incredibly cruel, kids. Yes. They nicknamed me FSU, fat, short, and ugly, and would call me that. And I was in tears. That was in uh, 1975. I'll never forget. Um, I was 12 at the time. And the girls in my bunk called me that. And yeah, and I didn't have that as much in school. Yes, I did, but to a lesser degree. But camp where it was, you know, 24 um, seven, that was hard. I was gonna that say, was really hard. must have been difficult. <laughs> so school wasn't as bad? I mean, I had, well, first of all, I moved, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I moved to New York when I was nine. Oh, I'm in New Jersey. <clears throat> and I grew up in Manhattan. And um, so first of all, the school that I went to started at nursery. So I was already the new kid because I came in in fourth grade and that was hard. Um, but luckily I was able to make, you know, it, it was a clicky type school. So there, there, there were, you know, groups of uh, kids that were friends. So I had my own uh, few friends that, you know, so yeah, it was hard. I mean, if it wasn't being made fun of for weight, it was um, my maiden name is Gordon and I was called Gullible Gordon. Oh, I was called the Hulk. Uh, that was around sixth grade. So yeah, not not fun growing up overweight. No. No. I remember personally always looking to see if I was the heaviest kid in the room. 
there were times when you go to like a party and they had those like cheap chairs. And I always wondered if I'm going to break the chair. <clears throat> People don't realize it sucks being overweight. Like they don't think about those things. But those are the things that happen to us. Well, and they don't think about it really because they they aren't experienced on the receiving end. They don't know what it's like to receive it. So so was it the same thing in high school and going all through that out? Um, well, thankfully, let's see. Um, I went to a nutritionist between eighth and ninth grade and I lost a lot of weight, so I... Oh, me too. And sophomore year for me. We got a lot of the same stuff going on. I'm sorry, let me... You keep going. That's okay. <clears throat> um, and... But, you know, slowly but surely, uh, I was putting on weight. Um, and then... My, I was in a situation where I grew up with people that were critical of my weight and, or that I, you know, I needed to always be eating X number of calories and, you know, this is before I moved out. And then even, even after I moved out, though, um, so there are were other factors in my environment that led me to overeating or eating and hiding. You know, a big thing with compulsive overeaters is we don't usually binge in front of other people. Exactly. We usually hide it. There's all sorts of ways of hiding it and getting rid of the remains or proof or whatever that we were overeating. And um, so it got to a point where in in my early 50s i'm i'm actually going to be 59 next month i'm 58 right now oh you don't look it Not oh, at all. thank you thank you um <clears throat> and so in my early 50s i had gotten up to 270 pounds and i'm only 5'1 so i was morbidly obese and I ended up in the hospital, unconscious in ICU for 102 days with acute pancreatitis. I nearly died twice. They told my family that I had a 1% chance of survival. And finally, they found an antibiotic that was starting to work. And in 1% increments, I recovered. So three months later, I'm, I wake up and, or they, it was an induced coma. So um, they, they got me up and then it was a slow, painful, 11 month recovery. I did, that was, I was hospitalized May 6th, I'm sorry, May 13th, the day after my son's 21st birthday. Um, and I came home, ironically, on my daughter's birthday, March 29th, almost a full year later. Um, and I had to be tube fed the entire time. And the other um, casualty was my voice because
I quote unquote had unusual neck anatomy. My trachs kept popping out, so they have to keep redoing them. Your trachea? Yeah, my the tracheostomies. You know when they they put a trach in yeah. your in here. Yeah. And they damaged my vocal cords. Oh. I know. I didn't used to speak like this, and and when I came home from the hospital, I couldn't speak at all. I that must have been scary. Uh, well, it was annoying as hell because I had to write out everything. Um, it took me two years of vocal therapy to get where I am now. Um, and that's why I definitely have to keep drinking water because if I don't, my voice will literally die um i learned to power my voice by speaking on the exhale but i don't always remember to do that so then it starts to die out plus i need water well as long as you can speak you know yep so but even, I mean, it was traumatic for my family. My kids had to say goodbye to me twice, thinking that I was not going to make it. My husband started making funeral plans. Um, and I didn't know anything of it. I was unconscious, so I can only imagine what they must have gone through. But even that wasn't enough to cure me um, of compulsive overeating, a scare like that. Um, because I was tube fed for nearly a year, I lost like 100 pounds. But once I came home, I mean, being tube fed doesn't cure you of your compulsive overeating triggers and behaviors and all of that. So six months later, I had put 60 pounds on. Wow. That is when I became, that's when I hit rock bottom because I was afraid I was going to end up back in the hospital and not come out this time. Um, so that is when I went to Overeaters Anonymous and I was able to lose that weight and I wanted to help others do the same. And yes, I've sponsored people, but I felt a calling for it. I couldn't go back to my last job anyway. I what did you used to do? I was a, for my career, I've been a technical instructor. First, I worked for Newsweek for seven years. Then I worked for the Museum of Modern Art for 19 and a half years. Wow. Six months into my hospitalization, they um, got rid of my position. And, you know... I couldn't have gone back anyway because I was training, you know, I was, when I was training, I was doing all the talking and I, I, I can't do that for, you know, three hours at a time at minimum. Some classes were full day classes. So, um, I needed to find another career. But there was only so much I could do not being able to really speak. But once I started being able to speak, I still can't work full time. I, I can't use my voice full time. So I needed a career. I wanted to help people in general 
And then once I went, I've always loved teaching because I would love the light that would come into people's eyes when I've taught them something that would help them do their job faster or easier or whatever. Um, and I wanted to use that to help others with what I knew best, which was compulsive overeating. So the first thing I did was I, I thought I'd be a health coach. So I went to the Institute of Integrative Nutrition to become uh, an integrative nutrition health coach, which is holistic health coaching where you could, you can, you know, coach people on, you know, relationships, career, finances, um, spirituality, you know, home, um, envi home environment, education, and, you know, there are like whatever nourishes you off the plate, so to speak, you know, you can coach somebody around anything, really, if you're a holistic health coach. But I felt like even though I could do that, that's not where I felt called because most people that want, let's say, a life coach or um, a health coach aren't necessarily compulsive overeaters. And I wanted to be able to help people that are going through what I've been through not necessarily the hospitalization part of it, but but the compulsive overeating part of it. Um, I But that's the only part I, I do know because I've, I've never been bulimic or anorexic. So the people that I coach are need to be compulsive overeaters, bingers that are most likely morbidly obese like I was. Um, so I became a certified food addiction coach, um, and, um, it is the biggest joy in my life. Um, it's what I, I truly feel it's what my higher power saved me for, because it was truly a miracle that I survived that hospitalization. And this is what I was saved for to do, to help people manage their compulsive overeating, to recover. But I go beyond recovery tools. Um, I get into mindset um, and uh, vision, an action plan, accountability accountability yes but that he you know what's the word that i'm looking for manifesting tools to set goals to manifest your dreams to manifest the goals that you set tools for that um i do an energy audit I get people to add things that, you know, energize them and get rid of things that zap you of energy. Um, I get into scripting for manifesting goals. I get into the limiting beliefs, you know, the limiting beliefs that we start accumulating when we're very young color the way we view our world and to be able to get someone to view their world differently is wonderful because limiting beliefs zap what we feel that we're able to do and accomplish Oh, I can't do that. I'm this, I'm that. I'm, you know, they color how you see your world, how, um, how you see yourself in it, how you think other people see you. Um, and mindset and 
clarity and having a vision, having a why is so important. You know, it's motivation isn't always in a constant high. And you need to cultivate it by having a solid, why do you want to get better? Why do you want to lose weight or manage your addiction? Why? Because if you don't have a solid why, the motivation will wane. So setting a vision that they want to create so badly that it propels them, they'll wake up every morning and have a plan and know what they need to do day to day, week to week, and so forth. Um, I don't know if I just ran a muck of <laughs> no, you were fine. A variety uh, of doing this now. So, uh, several years now. Okay, sounds like you really enjoy. It, like it's a passion of yours. Oh my gosh, yes. I've always wanted to help people anyway, but this was the best way because with with coaching. The client is the one that does most of 99% of the talking. You ask high mileage questions, not questions that could be answered with a yes or a no, maybe. Um, you know, the what, how, when, where, you know, get them to talk about what their issues are and dig into the root causes. Yeah, my voice is dying. There's always a root cause for the addiction, whatever the addiction, whatever emotion is popping up. Um, and you need to go, not necessarily just one level down. You need to get to the root or it's just gonna keep popping up again. The need to binge. I also have a plan, as I mentioned, that low protein, I'm sorry, high protein, low carb um, food plan. I can give people a range that if you eat between this range, you'll have fast weight loss. If you eat between this range, you'll have medium weight loss. If you have this range, you'll have slow or minimal or, you know, mm -hmm. none depending on how high you go. Obviously, the more carbs you eat, the less likely you're going to lose weight. So... Um, and it's just, I, I want to be able to help them with the obstacles that they have in their life to becoming healthy. It's not easy. There's always obstacles. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have obstacles. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. But, um, but yeah. So, so what are you doing nowadays to stay, um, you know, in, in line? Because I don't know if you use the word sober or not. Sober is more, I would think, for alcohol. Yeah, or, or um, drugs. Um, for overeating, it's usually abstinence. Abstinent. Okay, that's a good word. Um, and. Um, I was, I, I have to admit I've lapsed in my meetings, but I speak to my sponsor, um, like every day. I also have a health coach. I have a health coach, a business coach, a subconscious work coach. Um, I believe in coaching wholeheartedly. Um, and some people don't differentiate between therapists and coaches. They handle issues from two totally different avenues. 
therapists tend to go into the past where coaches, yes, you can look at the past, but are more, more focused on the present and setting, making action plans in the present to create your future. Because what we do today creates our future. Yeah. So um, I think that it's important where necessary to have, a, what do they call it? A health group kind of, um, there's a word for it, uh, where, you know, besides their physician, they may need a psychiatrist, a therapist, and a coach. They're all things. And, and I'm not a nutritionist. I don't have a degree for being a nutritionist. But to be honest, people already know what they should and shouldn't be doing. They really do. It's just... There's also subconscious work that needs to be done, which is why my manifesting tool for manifesting goals is really important because it trains your subconscious to think in alignment with your goals. Usually you're so, your subconscious is so hell bent on protecting you from everything that it doesn't want you to feel fear, resentment, anger, all of the negative and positive emotions. I've, I've eaten to celebrate, or I'm proud of something. You can be triggered to eat from any emotion. So it's helpful to train your mind, your subconscious, so that you're you know, I don't know if you've ever had people say, I I don't know why I'm doing this. I know I shouldn't be doing this. I should be doing this, you know. Hey, I shouldn't be doing X. I should be doing Y. But they can't help themselves. And one of the reasons is because their subconscious needs to be trained to instead of think of, protecting and not feeling your emotions instead to feel your emotions people need to feel their emotions both positive and negative emotions and then once they've felt them and gone through them they need to then let them go whatever the emotion is go through it I'm not ever going to say it is terrible to repress any emotion because all it will do is fester and it will end up getting you to do the wrong thing in the end. So it's better to experience the emotion, the emotion rather than repress it. And then once you've gone through it, let it go. As in spiritually, get, let, let your higher power take it from you. I frequently pray to my higher power to take away fear. Fears are more my thing than resentments. I, um, I, I fear everything. I, I'm a professional warrior. At least I was. Um, and... Please take, please, or please take this craving away from me. Please take X away from me. Spirituality is extremely important when healing. You need to heal in five different ways. Emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and habitually. You need to create the habits to support health. Yeah, I, very important. Yep. You, and 
people need to not go all gung-ho. I find when you go all gung-ho, you end up burning out. What you need to do is start whatever you're doing, whether it's making changes to your food plan or making changes to your exercise plan or whatever. Make small, sustainable changes. That is the key. Because otherwise, it's never going to be sustainable. Small, consistent, sustainable changes. And doing that over time creates the healthy habits that you need. Yeah. So it sounds like nowadays you're very happy. You went through hell, but you made it out the other end. And now you seem like a happy gal. Do you know, when I was looking through my hospital window, I was miserable. And... I had like had it with New York. Um, and then we I went back to my apartment. I even more had got, felt like I had to get out of New York. I am so happy here. Um, it's beautiful here. I live in Henderson um, and which is a suburb of Las Vegas. Um, and I love my business. I love my home life. I love, I, I exercise, depending on the season. Here's a perfect example of what I did for myself habits wise. I started by walking a quarter of a mile then half a mile, then three quarters. And I would gradually increase. And then at the by the beginning of the summer season, I was up to three and a quarter miles. Wow. But then it got too hot to walk, even at five o'clock in the morning. So I switched to swimming. Did I go all gung ho? No. I have a small pool and I, I swam 14 laps and decided that every time I swam, I was going to add two laps. I am now swimming 72 laps. That's amazing. And I decided to stop because that takes me a little bit over an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going any higher than that. Understood. So, well, you yeah, know, absolutely. You got to take, like you said, when you, steps. burning out is totally, absolutely. That's why I did all the stuff I do for the group. I, every night at about eight o'clock, I put my computer away and I'm done for the day. And I have my personal time. You know, I have a few hours to myself because I don't want to burn out. Yeah. And it's the same thing with with the exercise, especially if I thought about swimming 72 laps when I started, I was never going to swim. 14 was doable. And then after swimming 14, yeah, I can push it to 16 and then 18. And I think everybody knows how to count by two, so I won't keep going. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. Any changes in life should be done in small bits. Otherwise, it's overwhelming. Whenever you feel overwhelmed with a task, break it into small pieces, small one little step pieces. So getting towards the end here, question that I usually ask everyone. Uh, and this has been a, by the way, this has been a great interview. I just want to say you. that. It's yeah, been, it's been so awesome much so fun. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any advice for people watching, listening? Where do and this I could be that? personal, professional, <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever you think. I think 
my biggest piece of advice is to forgive yourself. You can't move forward until you forgive yourself and love yourself or learn to love yourself. Um, find someone who will love you until you love yourself. I know uh, Overeaters Anonymous is the place where you can go to find people who are non-judgmental or a uh, certified food addiction coach. Um, I am totally non-judgmental. So you would find a coach that that would be non-judgmental. You don't need to be judged. You need love. You need forgiveness. Not from other, we all need forgiveness from others, but we, what's more important than that is forgive yourself. Only you can do that. And to be able to move forward, you need to do that. Um, that's, that's my biggest piece. Awesome. It's great advice. I really, that's a, and that relates to any addict. It really does. Because if you, any addict has to make the decision to want to get better and you have to make that decision, you know? Absolutely true. So did you have anything else you would like to add? Um, certainly. Um, in addition, of course, uh, to going to Jim's website, you can also go to mine, amydambrosio.com. That's A M Y D A M B R O S I O dot com. And uh, you can read all about me. Um, I do have um, some suggested readings if you want to do that. Um, some recovery, um, they're actually all kind of recovery. Uh, oriented literature. Um, I highly recommend The Language of Letting Go by Melody Beatty. Um, uh, the 12 and 12, of course. Um, there's a great book um, called Food for Thought, uh, Meditation, Daily Meditations for Overeaters. Uh, it's a great book. Those are my three favorites. Um, uh, but I have some others. I have like five books listed there. Um, so you can take a look at my website. My phone number is on the website. And um, don't hesitate to contact me or text me. Um, at It's 332-201-3512. Text me if you'd like some help with compulsive overeating. So... Um, yeah. And I, w I wish everyone um, a, a peaceful, healthful journey to their dreams, whatever they are. All right. Thank you for I that. Send love. I send love to, to you all. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. All right, so let's wrap it up here. I really appreciate you coming on. It's really, like I said, a great interview. It's real cool. And um, sit tight for a minute. For everybody watching and listening, if you like what you saw and heard, go below and give us a like. Also, subscribe to see when we upload new videos. You can also check us out, as Amy said, at www.addicts-anonymous.com. There we have plenty of resources and free literature. We're also on social media like Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok. And that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and heard. And until next time.